if one day a part of your body stop was to stop working so your your leg was to stop working or your arm was to stop working would you would you still be you i was lucky because i also had today on answers you don't necessarily see it at the time but when you take a step back from yourself you kind of i i, I kind of think that i am yeah so i have been kind of quite coached to kind of be on the phone and you know chasing up an editor is often the same as chasing up a lead I kind of stumbled into a career outside outside of that and yeah I mean I, I would say my first big break writing an article for the times plan I might have planned to have a day off or a night off um and not doing work that, but then it's a fantastic sort of time sensitive story drops and you've got to be willing to kind of drop everything and react to it because quite frankly there's no one here to complicate things let's stay let's stick to the basics hello and welcome to the podcast today we have gus alexio who is a longtime journalist and a really really cool guy gus do you want to introduce yourself yeah hi laura um so yeah my name's gus and i am a journalist specializing in disability inclusion um and i've been doing that well, for over a decade now and one of the reasons that brought me into that is that i live with a long-term condition myself i was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis um at the age of 26 back in back in 2004 um i don't know how much uh, everyone knows about ms but it's a neurological condition which tends to affect younger people between the ages of 20 and 40 so 23 when it's diagnosed and yeah and in my case, that caused sort of the necessity to have a bit of a career break and a career reappraisal because I previously worked in sales and, you know, quite high octane kind of office, typical office work and stuff. And I realised that following my diagnosis and the MS symptoms that came, I realised that um, it would be not so easy to continue that kind of type of work. And so journalism is something I identified as something I could do from home and obviously had the lived experience of disability and a love of writing as well and all these things kind of came together to, to start writing about disability journalism really yeah. yeah so obviously you and i have talked a bit off camera as well before this podcast and i just find your story so so interesting and the way that you were able to turn something that a lot of people would have seen as uh, I don't know, just wouldn't have taken it very well and turned it into an entire career. That is so inspiring to me. So in getting into this kind of line of work, what was your first big break? Can you tell me about that? Yeah, I mean, I should also add that I also didn't take it, didn't take it particularly well. Um, and, it, and it took me sort of quite, quite a few years to kind of get back on my feet, for want, for want of a better phrase. But yeah, um, I, I guess, no, the kind of stars aligned to a certain extent, because I had always enjoyed writing and I'd done a history degree at university, which is obviously a very kind of essay mm. research kind of analysis based degree. And I'd had a love of that from a, from, from a young age, but I happened to sort of stumble into a career in, in, in sales because I think at that age, you know, 21, 22, we, we, we often stumble into careers apart from those of us who are very driven to kind of do one thing from teen, teenage years. So I kind of stumbled into a career outside outside of that. And yeah, I mean, I, I would say my first big break came um, writing an article for The Times in, in, in 2012. And I was lucky because I also had a good network of people around me and um, friends and family who are willing to sort of, who, who happen to know people who worked at newspapers and magazines and where it was where, where it was applicable. They introduced me to editors and stuff like that. And I was able to, to get my name out there. And, and they, they, I also sort of did in the years Previous to that, I had done some work sort of building up a writing portfolio. I'd written for charity publications um, and things like this. And you know, that, that's often unpaid work, but at least it gets your name in print. So it kind of gets gets things started, uh, as it were. But yeah, my first kind of main article, I would say, was, was in 2012. Yeah, that's so cool, though. Time, that's literally insane. Uh, I, I think that it's so interesting how you say that you got lucky as well that you had people who knew people, but I think a lot of us listening, especially would be surprised at how many people we actually know. You have this drive in you that I really, really admire where you do have this entrepreneurial spirit. And you say that it's because of like the sales stuff that you've done before. 
but you also did all that work to build up your portfolio for free. I feel like I would love to hear more about how you built that portfolio and then also what it was like to have to chase down kind of leads almost. Yeah, I mean, that, uh, uh, as I say, build, building the portfolio actually was the kind of easier side of it, I would say, in that because I was writing for charity publications and because I was writing the, the first charities I sort of targeted were MS charities and neuro, um, neuro charities supporting people with neurological conditions. So I had that kind of lived experience that I could instantly sort of jump off and just sort of write about. I didn't necessarily have to do a huge amount of research to do for, for those articles. And they're always kind of wanting wanting writers. And I, I suppose, yes, you mentioned the, the sort of sales background. Um, you know, you don't necessarily see it at the time, but when you take a step back from yourself, you kind of, I, I kind of think that I am, yeah. So I have been kind of quite coached to kind of be on the phone and have a, ch do, do a lot of chasing up, you know, chasing up an editor is often the same as chasing up a lead. Uh, the, the same kind of principles are involved in that. Um, and I'm quite persistent as well. Once I kind mm. of, you know, I, I, I'm one of these people that I'm, I might take a long time to get something started or I might leave things on the back burner for too long. I really should get started. But once I start, I kind of, or once I get to a certain step, I'd sort of, insist i have to myself i have to get to the next step and i and i will kind of push through on that um and 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 keep talking about i also think that maybe and i don't know because i haven't been on the other side of the on, on necessarily on the side of the fence of that but maybe because i was pitching disability related articles to people and because i was coming at it from the lived experience of disability so i wasn't just right. saying oh, hey I have something i want to write about i was saying i actually have some experience of this that maybe it engenders a kind of natural sympathy from editors right. that maybe they didn't want to sort of look to be dismissive of, oh, wait, we don't want to cover this stuff. Maybe, you know, a lot of these publications want to be inclusive. And so that maybe went in my favor and was something worth, not that I kind of ruthlessly exploited it, but it was worth kind of exploiting to a certain extent. I think it just lent itself to the kind of stuff I was writing about. It was maybe if I was writing about business or sport or something, and, and that also being a more crowded marketplace with lots of other journalists competing, I might have had shorter yeah. shrift, but. But no, I think I was lucky. I just think I had a good supportive network. And I think a lot of the editors I dealt with in those early days were just generally good listeners. And they, they generally polite, professional, and they gave them their time. And I think they were generally interested in my lived experience. I mean, your lived experience is really interesting, kind of unlucky, lucky in a way. I, would, I mean, I reached out to you. So clearly, I think it's interesting as well. In terms of Constructing stories, how with something like MS and um, different areas of disability, how do you strike that balance between giving entertainment value and then also talking about the issues that might be uncomfortable for people? Yeah, I mean, I, I think often with disability, actually, they're one of the same thing in that the, you, the entertainment value is maybe the wrong phrase, but people have a kind of maybe morbid curiosity for those kind of darker oh, yeah, aspects of, of, of certain disability, um, which is often over I think, in in, in, in Hollywood and, and, and in and film and stuff like that. But I, I think that's probably, if you're talking to an editor or something like that, that's probably what draws them in sometimes because they think it, you know, it, it, it might appeal to people or it's just the, un, or it's just the unknown or it's a taboo or, it, or it's things like that. I mean, I remember, I do remember that with that first article, I wrote for for the Times. Um, I actually it ended up being a kind. So I actually when I was initially pitching to them, I was pitching a completely different article, which was about employment and uh, disability, well, employment and disability. But it had as the kind of case study someone I, I knew with multiple sclerosis as a case study, and they they kind of liked it, but they didn't sort of pull the trigger on it. They weren't kind of they kind of said, yeah, you know, we'll, we, we could run with it, but they weren't being a bit wishy washy about when they were going to actually publish it and in the end they the article that I actually ended up publishing with them was a very different piece and it kind of drew on the news it came the day after the news broke and uh, um, about Ozzy Osbourne's son Jack Osbourne so he was Jack so Jack Osbourne was diagnosed at my age basically he was 26 um, and I had been 26 when I was diagnosed but a few years later he was also diagnosed at the age of 26 and that news broke across all of the press and because I've had a relationship with that editor they knew that I was someone who wanted to write about MS and thought, hey, we could publish an article the very next day um, penned by someone who is a few years older than Jack, but is also, you know, diagnosed with MS at the very same, very same, very same age. And they, they obviously thought that would be kind of good authorship to, 
to have that. And actually, that's that's also where some of the charity uh, publication stuff um, I was quite lucky about because I had another article I'd written about my own experiences because I think one of one of the issues I think I was telling you before I'll call one of the issues with that article is that that having pitched the having pitched for them for months and months and wanted to get published by them and and wanting to pre prepare articles and spend lots of weeks doing it. The one caveat that this editor asked for me is, yeah, we'd like to do the Jack Osborne article. Can you send it to us in in two, three hours from now? Can you send it right. to us by the end of the day? And so I was like, oh, God, I had all that time and now I have no time. But I actually put the news with Jack Osborne, spliced it together with some of the stuff I'd done previously, talking about my own experiences mm-hmm. and managed to make it work as a kind of cohesive whole where, you know, it got every. I mean, that's the more you do journalism, the more you, the more you do realise that readers do like a kind of and it's and it, obviously it makes absolute sense readers do like a news element they like a news hook they want to kind of read well, why why is this person writing about ms now why is ms in the news now often because the world we live in sometimes it takes a celebrity diagnosis or something like that to actually get people's initial attention and maybe right. that filter through which they learn i mean obviously you have um selma blair and christina applegate that that have it now and they those two have been in the news quite a bit but sometimes it yeah it takes a kind of celebrity having the condition for people to learn more I mean I feel like that that totally is in line with uh, other marketing practices news jacking is a really really good hack for anyone wanting to look to get more attention on their posts if you go and you see what's in the news or what's going viral and you relate it to your niche it's a lot more likely to get attention. It's a lot more likely to get eyes. And it's kind of just being prepared for that and having the right thing in the right time. And I I feel like it's so interesting to me how you keep on thinking that you're lucky though, because every successful person that I've talked to, right? <laughs> they're, they all say they're lucky, but they seem to take a lot of shots. You're a lot luckier the more you, you go for it. And I really admire that about you. I, I'm yeah. wondering if within your stories to make them more engaging, if there are any like tips and tricks that you have to make them better, like what are the things you've learned over the years as a journalist? Yeah, I mean, certainly that kind of news hook element is in, is, right. is important. Obviously, you have stories that um, are very much kind of news stories, items of news uh, that you're reacting to. Um, and they're great, and obviously they're they're sometimes hard to predict uh, when they come along. But you've got to kind of be ready and be prepared for them to come along, and also kind of be, sometimes in journalism, sort of be flexible with your time. Often with these kind of stories, I you know would have planned I might have planned to have a day off or a night off um, and right. not doing work, that, but then it's a fantastic sort of time sensitive story drops, and you've got to be willing to kind of drop everything and react to it because quite frankly other publications will have picked it up by the next day. So it's no use you picking up the same story um, three days later or announcing the same news three days later. And I guess the other tip I would give is to kind of try and differentiate a bit, try and differentiate from the news buzz, include the news, give the readers the actual, the bare facts, because they do want that. They want the kind of raw facts, but also can you make it, can you make it sound different? Can you give an interpretation that's slightly different to just what everyone else is saying? So can you spin it uniquely? And obviously that type of, um, stories are what we call evergreen uh, stories, so they're not tied to anything in the news. They're just things of ongoing, you know, ongoing interest. Like, for example, I mean, in the disability context, like something like employment and disability is always going to be um, an interesting issue within disability inclusion, um, an interesting area to write about. And those you can sort of pre-prepare those a little bit more. You can have a good think about what kind of interviewees you might want to get on board. Uh, with the news stories, you know, you're often a bit more reacting. You're under time pressure to 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 to, to find one straight away. You need to get it out within that kind of news wave with the evergreen stories. You can plan it out a little bit more. So I just think you've got to sort of be aware of the different type of story you might be dealing with at any one time, and just sort of be a try and be ahead of the curve. Try and you know, if you're dealing with uh, press agents, for example, and they're talking about sort of a news announcement um or you develop a relationship with them try you know or, you know try and say to them listen can if you're doing a press release can you send that to me ahead of time can you send that to, if you're sending it to everyone else in the press on tuesday can you send it to me on friday of course i'll, I'll respect your embargo yeah. but you know so it's negotiating with that, that 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 end of it as well that's so interesting i'm really curious as well 
Who would be your dream person to interview if you could interview one person tomorrow? Oh, who would my who would be my dream person to interview? I don't Yeah. know. Um, so that's 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 that, that, that's that is a that is an interesting um, question. I I don't know. Do you know what? I think it would be. I'm not sure it would be. Well, listen. I I I do. So I do disability journalism, um, Mm and I love it. And because it's something I know very well, I would have always liked to have done, and I have done a bit of it for, but 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 not pro- a professional level, sports journalism and things like this and, and things like this. Um, so I, but that was a very crowded market, as I explained. Like you know, the disability market was a slightly easier and more authentic one to get into. So there's all kinds of like sports. people like I would have loved to have interviewed like here at sports heroes of my I'm a, I'm a f- soccer fan f- well football fan and uh, I support Chelsea so I'd love to have interviewed um, I like Chelsea. Jack- How do you, we not you did talk about this? I like Chelsea. yes yes and, and, and you lived in West London for a little bit didn't you you mentioned Yeah, so I lived in Hammersmith. so that's why the connection is, is, is there so it's more yeah. I literally built an entire TikTok following off of the fact that I like Chelsea football because I got obsessed with it two years ago. What, Yeah. what year were you living? What year were you living there? Um, wait, like two, three years ago. I don't exactly know. Okay, so it was, so they were still relatively successful, not like they were now. So it wasn't it wasn't No, the that's absolute so bad. great days, but it was a uh, yeah yeah okay. Well, it's good that you chose Chelsea and not not Queens Park Rangers. So yes, there, there's there's all kinds of people from the world of football that I would have liked to that have been the dream person to actually interview. Although I don't know if I'd have had to go over my bashfulness, but actually. In, in the disability inclusion space, though though I've spoken to a lot of kind of great CEOs and great people, of, you know, in, in all kinds of positions and politicians and actors and people in all kinds of positions of power, the, the in, one of the insights I'm really interested in with disability inclusion is actually because when you have a condition yourself, you tend to focus quite a lot on analysing your life and could things have, how would things have worked out differently for me and What if I'd been diagnosed with MS 20 years later rather than when I was? And then also looking back at it the other way, because I was diagnosed in my mid-20s, I often think what would it have been like to have grown up with a disability? So I went through my formative years in school and uni as a able-bodied, as a non-disabled person. Um, and, and I was wondering what kind of would be. I have a lot of admiration, a lot of admiration, actually, for, for kids that are going through education, the education system, living with disability, in particular kids that are going through the mainstream education systems. I think a special, specialist schools are a different thing and they're, 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 they're an important kind of closed, almost safer environment for, for, for certain. But children that are that, you know, t- young people who are out there in the mainstream education system having to live with a disability. I mean, I struggle a lot to, to deal with mine. And I was in my mid-20s, I was, a, you know, at least an adult, you know, a young adult, but an adult nonetheless. So how are these younger people you know in their formative years so actually I, I mean I've actually talked to a few of um to, to a few of them in, in the, some of the writings I've done for Forbes I did an article a few months ago about um going to university uh, or college as you call it in in, in the states with, with a disability and the young lady that had that was that had navigating that process and that just fascinates me because I just want always just from a personal point of view because I just always wonder how I would have dealt with the things that I have to deal with now but how I would have dealt with that net back then so yeah it would be it's, it's actually the everyday people sometimes that could be the most interesting interviewees rather than yeah the luminaries. this your experience with ms as an adult what has that been like for you so yeah that's been that, that I, can't, i can't say anything other than that's that's been really tough i mean everyone I, i would i would say that everyone's experience with ms is different it's a very variable condition um So no two patients with MS are alike, although there's a kind of collection of symptoms that are often associated with mm-hmm. MS. But there's very few people that get all of them. Mm-hmm. There's mostly that, you know, you might get one or two emphasized in certain areas. You may go your entire life without getting certain ones at all. Um, it's a scary kind of disease to get. Not that any disease is pretty, you know. Not nice to get, but it's a scary one to get just because the sort of nature of how the symptoms come up, it can be quite subtle and you can kind of be questioning what's going on. And then also it happens when you're young, when you're least sort of braced for it because you expect to be healthy. And you know, right. it's not MS is not typically a condition of kind of someone who's been sort of ill, Ill as a child or 
sort of, you know, sickly as a child or anything like that. You often it's perfectly healthy people in the prime of their life and suddenly the symptoms start. And often when you start reading about it and stuff like that, um, you you hear about the worst case scenarios of it and you hear about the word wheelchair is, is in there pretty quickly and you think, oh my God, am I going to end up in the wheelchair? It's the first thought you have. Um, and dealing with that side of it, just the kind of stuff that goes on in your head, especially at the beginning, of how am I going to be? How am I going to be in a year, two years, three years is, is, is very tough. But then also the other side of it of just interacting with the outside world. It, you know, right. it's tough because at the end of the day, it's better than, you know, 20 years on, the world is better than it was then when I was diagnosed, but it's still not, it's still not designed for disabled people. It's still not necessarily at the most disability inclusive space. It's, it, 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 it's better. Um, but then, you know, I say with a condition like that, often that's going through the filter. If you, if you are of that age, if you are in your mid twenties, early thirties and whatever, what have you, or younger than that, you know, that's going through the filter of what young people are doing. And you're trying to sort of put that through that, that, you know, so, so for example, what my friends and contemporaries were doing at that time was what I had been doing sort of months previous to my diagnosis, which was working quite hard, going out to, you know, nightclubs, restaurants, you know, quite, you know, heavy social life, um, stuff like this, parties, all this, because that's what you're supposed to do when you're in your mid-20s. So when you're having to kind of consider things like fatigue and potentially walking problems and eyesight problems and the, these kind of things in that context, they especially it's especially more jarring than it would be if, I don't know if you're in your 50s and that's still not a good time to develop a disability either but when you're in your fifth if you're in your 50s and you're a bit more sedate and your family life and your career is a bit more settled it's obviously easier to adjust to a disability but you know kind of ms is the opposite of what being in your 20s should be mm. and bringing those two things and yeah it happens a lot to people in their 20s and so bringing those two things together you know that is, is tough Totally. And just for people listening who might not know what MS is, could you briefly describe what MS is and some of the symptoms that someone might experience? Yeah, absolutely. So MS is a kind of, it's a neuro condition, but it starts with the immune system. So the immune system obviously is the sort of body's bouncer, um, which protects us from all kinds of infections and because of things like this. And in MS, someone's immune system goes haywire. Um, and it for reasons they don't still don't quite understand, it mistakes the tissues in the central nervous system. And your central nervous system is obviously the wiring that goes between your brain and your 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 eyes and your muscles and your you know and your upper arms and your and your legs and that. So it attacks a substance, a specific substance in your central nervous system um, called myelin, which is the insulation of the nerves. So the nerves in your system, in your ner in your nervous system, are like wires. The myelin is like the wrap around the wire that makes the electrical signals conduct smoothly and go through the, the wire smoothly. And MS, for, for reasons not fully understood, in MS, the body's immune system sees something in the myelin as a foreign invader and attacks it in certain areas and causes inflammation in those nerves um, and what they call demyelination, which is just kind of loss of, my, loss of myelin. And the inflammation, depending on where it might be in the nervous system, will cause a symptom. So if it's in your optic nerve, the inf it will cause a problem with your eyesight. If it's in further down in your spinal um, spinal cord, it might cause a problem with your walking or your hand movement, your dexterity or something like that. So this is why I say everyone with MS is different, because it's essentially, it, if you look at an MS brain in a scan, it's little dots of damage, which they call MS plaques. Mm -hmm. And where you get those dots, depends on where the symptoms will be. And if you don't have dots in a certain area, you don't have you don't have the symptoms. And they say everyone's MS, everyone's MRI scan or MS brain is almost as like a unique as a fingerprint. So if you don't have damage in that area, you'll be okay. If you do have damage in that area, you'll have problems. And it's a very, as I say, it's a very, very unpredictable disease. And I've, I've heard, I'm, I'm, no, I'm not a doctor, but I've, uh, I've heard from medical readings that I've done that you can have people with lots of lots of MS scars in their brain and not that much disability. And mm -hmm. you can have people with a very few, a, a, few num a small number of scars in their brain and lots of them and, and, lo and lots of disability because it's in, it happens to be in a critical area. So it doesn't always, so okay. it's a tough and mysterious disease and 
the dots are called um, sclerosis plaques. So that's, this is why it's called multiple sclerosis. So that sclerosis means scarring. So multiple, many scars. So yeah, that's a, that's my explainer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's so interesting. And obviously, I'm not surprised at how well, well versed you are in actual science behind it, what's happening in the body. But it's, it's just crazy how we can just take for granted everything that's going around. Like I definitely, after hearing what people with MS go through, I am more grateful, you know, for the health that I have right now at 25, for sure. I just, I admire you so much. It must've felt like a left, right hook from God at the time. Yeah. And so you're, 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 you are, you are my, you are the age I was when I, so I was diagnosed at 26, but my symptoms did start when I was 25. Um, so yeah. And it, it, and it does feel like that. Although, actually, the funny thing with um, with with living with any kind of disability or illness is that you do begin to kind of you do also tend to appreciate more what you don't have. So I often think to myself, you know, when I look back at life, I think if I had known when I was if I had known when I was twenty one, twenty two, twenty three, quite how tough life could really be. Mm -hmm. I would have let all of those little things that really bugged me at the time back then, those kind of small trite things, go completely. And I would have also, if I'd known, you know, you, you also think, well, I maybe I would have made more of my life, or maybe if I if I'd known I had limited time, I would have done more in, in certain areas. But I think when you do experience it, you do like appreciate what you have left. So I think I mm -hmm. super appreciate the bits of my nervous system and my brain that still work. Basically, yeah. I kind of you know. I'm so grateful to have them, even though I wish I didn't have that those damaged parts as well. Um, and I think another another unfortunate part of MS is that, and again, this is another tricky bit because we don't always know exactly how it works. Is that you also get top, you hear the phrase a lot or the word a lot when you talk to doctors about MS of progressive. So this is this can be progressive, might get worse, but we don't know at what rate you'll get worse or if you'll really get worse. And I I happen to be Again, it's the work, work lucky. I don't know if it's lucky or not lucky, really. But I happen to be someone who's on a, on a tr on quite a strong treatment. Um, mm -hmm. So the so MS treatments are now a lot better than they were when I was first diagnosed, and certainly a lot better than when I was growing up in the nineties. There was very little stuff. Um, by the early two thousands, there was a bit more stuff, and now there's actually a lot of choices. But I happen to I was diagnosed in two thousand and four, and by two thousand and eight around this sort of time you're getting what they call high efficacy disease modifying therapies coming out which mm -hmm. you know do say and what's interesting is that because they're so new those drugs um you don't actually know what someone with ms how someone with ms lives with those things for 20 30 40 years because we don't have the data because the drugs the drugs are also mm -hmm. new so you kind of can find some comfort in that and go well maybe actually you know I'll do better than expected or my progression will be different because I'm I'm on this but but you never know um so it seems That's to awesome. be weird. well I hope that they just keep on coming out with better and better stuff for MS well but, the, the, the holy grail is to have something that actually um repairs or some of the yeah. damage or or, or, at least it, or or concretely if they can't repair it concretely stops it but yeah yeah I, That's so we true. follow the research we hope well, we're running out of time, so I'm going to ask you one last question, which is for you to leave a question for everyone else who's listening. What is one thing that you would want everyone who's listening right now to really take home and think about and internalize forever? <laughs> I would um, think if people who don't have any touch point um, with disability in their life, um, to really think about you know if one day a part of your body stop was to stop working so your your leg was to stop working or your arm was to stop working would you would you still be you would you still be sure it would take a massive period of adjustment when if something like that happened it'd be shocking but would would you not still be you really um and and, and, and you know you can have someone with a you know who can't walk or or might have sight problems or whatever but actually if they're just sitting down having a conversation like we are is that person disabled at, at that actual time really for intents and purposes i think one of the problems we have with disability is it become people or the perspective of people who don't have disability or are non-disabled is that they see it as a constant all-encompassing thing and there's a lot of kind of 
oh my god i don't know how you cope and i don't know and actually do you know what it's, it's no pretending it, it is really hard but it's not it doesn't define every single aspect of you it defines a lot at certain times and almost nothing at other times depending on what you're doing and you're still you so i say ask those people if you if you hurt your leg or hurt your arm or you know even lost the limb you know would that wipe out your entire history would you stop being you would you just become someone that you wouldn't you'd still be you so it's to try and get people to think about that about disability that at the end of the day we're all just people and actually in certain situations our disability is almost insignificant and and, and so you know maybe just trying to break some of that get people to ask themselves questions about where their self really comes from and breaks some of those taboos, I don't know. I love that. Yeah, you're such an interesting guy. Thanks so much again for being on this podcast. My pleasure. Cheers. We both know what we want. Let's just keep it safe.